shipping out. After one month in the New York Harbor, the USNS Comfort sets sail, a sign of hope that the 1,000 bed floating hospital is no longer needed. Out of work and running out of options, another historic milestone for unemployment claims. As states roll out reopening strategies, food banks are running out of supplies. Tense moments in Michigan as protesters confront police. Finding a treatment, FDA approval may be on the way for remdesivir, and word that vaccine could be possible by January. COVID in conflict zones, fighting the coronavirus in places of constant fighting among humans, inside the war-torn hospitals where a new battle is beginning. New details on the allegation that Vice President Joe Biden sexually assaulted a young woman who worked in his Senate office in the 90s. The woman comes forward as his campaign denies the claim. And mask on, the Vice President today covering up after facing criticism for going maskless at the Mayo Clinic. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Lindsay Davis. I want to start with a quote that I recently read that said, the obituary of New York City has been written more than once, and it has always proven incorrect. While the numbers and statistics in New York remain grim, the image today of the USNS Comfort departing New York could be viewed as a symbol of hope for the entire country that things are getting better. And ready or not, many states have already started to lift restrictions, especially in the South. Some plan to reopen tomorrow, with others following suit on Monday and at the end of next week. And then there are the holdouts. Some states are extending stay-at-home orders. In fact, a few places are reopening and extending some restrictions at the very same time. In Washington and Indiana, those orders expire tomorrow, but it's unclear what that actually means for residents. The economy, meanwhile, still faltering. 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment last week, bringing the number to more than 30 million people who have lost their jobs in the last six weeks. Millions of homeowners who no longer have income but still have mortgages payments. ABC's Victor Akendo has their story. Tonight, with those unemployment numbers skyrocketing, these food lines are becoming the new normal. These scenes today from Phoenix. It's the last day of the month, and that means bills are due. Rent, car insurance, car payment, electricity, uh, internet, groceries, uh, school. Marissa Jenks is a college student who was laid off from her waitress job. She filed for unemployment more than a month ago and is still waiting when she tries to check the website. It says the system has experienced an unexpected technical error. It happens every time I get nowhere. In the long term, as Florida and other states make plans to reopen, some governors are imposing restrictions on the ability of people to collect unemployment if they choose not to return to work because they don't feel safe. But in the short term, Homeowners like Haiti Fernandez Stampa and her husband, who own a catering company in Las Vegas, are worried about their mortgage. It's been scary. Priority is the mortgage to keep that up, to keep the lights on, just to keep surviving. By one count, 3.8 million American homeowners skipped mortgage payments last month. Many lenders are currently offering forbearance, a temporary grace period that lets borrowers pause payments. Under the CARES Act passed by Congress, you have up to a year for most mortgages. They've got a lot of wiggle room to work with you now, but if you fall behind a couple of months and they've got to chase you down, uh, that's when the options are going to be a lot thinner. And Victor Akendo joins us now with more. Victor, if a state says the businesses can reopen, but the workers don't feel comfortable going back to work because of concerns about the virus, could they then be denied unemployment benefits? Lindsay, states are grappling with this issue. In Texas, officials there just announced you can con continue to collect unemployment if you have a valid reason for not returning to work. Now, in some places like Utah and Missouri, you have businesses actually lobbying states for protection against lawsuits if their employees were to get sick on the job. Unions are now pushing back. This is something that will be addressed in the next coronavirus relief bill. Lindsay? And, Victor, of course, we've reported on the struggle that many are going through to actually get these benefits. You're, of course, in Florida. Florida, the governor there actually said that the state's unemployment system was, quote, designed to fail. So how that how's that playing out? Well, Lindsay, he also called it a clunker, and he blamed all the issues with it on the former administration, but they have been doing a good amount of work on it. Our uh, local affiliate here, WPLG, actually spoke with the man who's in charge of fixing this faulty system. They had to take it offline last weekend, and now what they're doing, well, one of the things they're doing is actually taking it offline overnight. So from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., you cannot access that website, and that's actually, uh, that time is being used to process those new claims, but it is far 
from perfect Marissa, who you just heard from in our piece. She applied more than a month ago. She has still not heard back. And when she checked her status today, an error message came up on the unemployment website. An Lindsay? error message. Okay. All right, Victor Akendo, thanks so much for your reporting. Now to the race for vaccine. Today, the White House unveiled an aggressive new timeline to find a way to inoculate the virus. This is states grapple with how to stay safe and get Americans back to work. ABC's Whit Johnson has the latest. Less than 24 hours after the coronavirus task force announced promising results for a drug that could help treat the virus, remdesivir, tonight comes word the president is working to fast track something else, a vaccine. The plan, called Operation Warp Speed, is the administration's new effort to speed up the timeline for a vaccine by the end of the year. I hope we're going to have a vaccine, and, and we're going to fast-track it like you've never seen before. The government and the military teaming up with industry to mass-produce doses of the vaccine by January 2021. You know who's in charge of it? Honestly, I am. I'll tell you, I'm really in charge of it. Today, Dr. Anthony Fauci pressed, is that feasible? I was saying in January and February that it would be a year to 18 months. So January is a year. So, so it isn't that much yeah. from what I had originally said. But you don't wait until you get an answer before you start manufacturing. You at risk proactively start making it assuming it's going to work. What's unclear is which vaccine the White House task force is going to take a chance on. Also today, Vice President Mike Pence seen for the first time wearing a mask while touring a ventilator facility after an uproar 48 hours ago for not wearing one at a visit to the Mayo Clinic. Today, the vice president's wife saying he didn't know. It was actually after he left Mayo Clinic that he found out that they had a policy of asking everyone to wear a mask. And after questions were raised weeks ago about where the virus came from, tonight the director of national intelligence offering a rare statement, agreeing with the wide scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified, but adding they will continue to examine if it was the result of an accident at a laboratory in Wuhan. The president was asked about it moments ago. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus. Yes, I have. The president wouldn't reveal what the information is. In New York, unprecedented steps to fight the spread of the virus by sanitizing public transit. Images of the homeless sleeping on subways, prompting the governor to shut down subway and commuter trains overnight starting next week, every 24 hours to be disinfected. Frontline workers will be offered free rides. They're on those trains. They deserve to be kept safe. They deserve to have a clean, safe ride to and from work. Uh, and they're going to have it. Uh, and we're going to move heaven and earth to make sure that happens. The number is statewide on the decline, but still 306 people died in just 24 hours. And what is his diagnosis? In Illinois, the peak not expected for another two weeks, are Alex Perez with paramedics in Chicago. This company responding to 150 calls in one day, most of them COVID cases. So this is the new routine every time you arrive to a call? Yeah, every time. Every time. In California, the governor cracking down, closing beaches in Orange County after large crowds flocked to the coast last weekend. The images we saw uh, on a few of our beaches were disturbing. I was very candid about that. Los Angeles County reporting its largest single-day surge in cases on Wednesday. But the mayor of L.A. is looking ahead, announcing an ambitious plan to offer a coronavirus test to all residents, regardless of symptoms. Across the country, at least 32 states now easing some restrictions by the end of next week. But cases of the virus still rising in at least 18 states. Tonight, the FDA expected a green light emergency treatment with that promising drug, remdesivir. Chriselda Davis believes it saved her. Are you ready to blow it out? Yes. Blow it out. You got enough breath? I hope so, yeah. Here celebrating her 46th birthday after surviving 11 days on a ventilator. I'm very grateful. I'm very, very grateful to be alive. Chriselda's husband watched her improve three days into the treatment. Her lungs had begun to clear up and uh, her vitals was, was getting better. And Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, back to that vaccine. They're giving that January timeline. What's the exact expectation in January? How many doses does the task force think that they can produce by then? 
Well, Lindsay, Dr. Fauci says it's possible they could produce hundreds of millions of doses to be ready to go by January of next year. But at this point, there are more than 100 vaccines currently in the works, including eight which are approved for clinical trials. So it's not clear which vaccine will actually work and which one the White House task force will ultimately get behind. Lindsay? Whit Johnson for us tonight in New York City. Thanks so much, Whit. And overseas now, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the worst of the outbreak in the UK is over. In total, the virus killed nearly 27,000 there. Johnson just recovered from COVID himself. So far, he has not released any details on just how the UK will reopen. And we've been using the phrase the front lines in the battle against the virus, but you're about to meet some people who have truly been on the front lines of war. In Syria, where years of relentless war have caused a humanitarian disaster, doctors find themselves ill-equipped to confront the virus, especially in Idlib, where hospitals have been targeted, and in Yemen, where airstrikes have reportedly risen after a ceasefire was put in place. Doctors are especially worried about widespread hunger. Our Ian panel has more on what it's like to face COVID in a conflict zone. The world's in the grip of the coronavirus pandemic. Even wealthy countries struggle to battle this unseen enemy. But people trapped in war-torn areas in the Middle East are facing potential devastation. In parts of Syria, where civil wars raged for nearly a decade, Russian and regime planes have repeatedly attacked medical facilities and staff, according to human rights groups and activists. The deliberate bombing of hospital for nine years has devastated a healthcare system already run by the war. Many physicians have lost their lives. Dr. Wasim Zakaria is one of the few physicians still working in rebel-held Idlib in northwest Syria. We are watching on TV medical personnel getting infected and dying in the best equipped hospital in the most advanced countries. How could we even stand a chance of surviving in our collapsed medical system? While Syria has seen just a few confirmed cases of coronavirus, Dr. Zakaria believes the real number is likely much higher. I myself have been have seen uh, 30 to 40 patients with symptoms of COVID-19. All patients tested was negative. The World Health Organization sent almost 6,000 testing kits to Idlib, which have been carefully rationed. We have very few numbers of ventilators. We were promised some by the WHO and the other organization, but so far received none. What is the status of those ventilators right now? We've, uh, I believe, helped bring in upwards of 60 ventilators. What's far more important is scaling up the other measures that, that we know work, the testing, the isolation, uh, of, of patients early in their illness and giving them proper oxygen therapy before they need a ventilator. The truce in Idlib was reached just before a pandemic was declared, with the disease becoming the main focus of attention for all sides involved in the conflict. But as the fighting subsided for now, the rebels remain cautious. Great countries were unable to combat the coronavirus. So imagine Assad's regime, whose economy has been affected for 10 years. If the coronavirus did not exist, the regime would have resumed its military operations over a month ago. Some refugees are using the pause in fighting to make the perilous decision to return home from overcrowded camps, referring the risk of renewed violence to the risk of COVID-19. It's an incredibly challenging choice that families need to make. Do I stay in a place where I'm at greater risk for, for catching a disease like COVID? Or do I do a go, move to a place where I've got more space, there, there's a better water supply, but the security is, is much more questionable? The United Nations is calling for a global ceasefire to prevent a major health crisis from further ravishing conflict zones. There's evidence fighting has subsided in some areas like Syria, but in others, there's been no let up. Yemen was already home to the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Imagine what an outbreak of COVID-19 would do here. In both countries, it's complex because you've got different parts of the country under control, uh, under the control of different authorities or different rebel or opposition groups. We haven't seen the explosive outbreaks yet, uh, but uh, 
we can be very confident there are significantly more cases than we've been able to detect. A ceasefire between the US-backed Saudi coalition and the Houthis, a rebel group backed by Iran, is barely standing. The New York-based International Rescue Committee says fighting and airstrikes on civilians were up last week, disrupting efforts to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We are hearing in TV this uh, uh, nice song of ceasefire. But at the same time, at that night, they announced the ceasefire in Yemen. They strike Sana'a with fifth, fifth, more than 50 uh, airstrikes. A World Health Organization study says more than half of Yemen healthcare facilities are closed or only partially functioning. And aid groups say many medical workers have fled the country as a result of being targeted in the conflict. Most of the medical centers and the facilities of the uh, health in Yemen were destroyed, uh, some of them totally. Food shortages are just as deadly as violence and disease. Huh? Bilal. We have Bilal, who is suffering from from malnutrition, from a severe malnutrition. Uh, but in many cases, people who need medical attention aren't getting help out of fear of the coronavirus. People are afraid from coronavirus and are, are not coming to this clinic. Uh, imagine their normal days if, uh, if there is no coronavirus and uh, uh, and uh, the, the sittings are very normal uh, this clinic sh is or is uh, usually very very crowded with uh, with uh, 60 to 80 uh, patients a day conflict and hunger are often vicious bedfellows and aid agencies fear the global pandemic risks making both worse you know, of this 135 million people who go to bed, who are acutely hungry, vast majority, 77 million of those are in countries affected by conflict. So unless we take care of conflict, we are not going to take care of hunger. In places where people are already living under the cloud of war, the pandemic threatens to be a deadly obstacle to critical aid reaching those in greatest need. You have about 30 million people who are stuck in these places and um, they're not going to be able to get out of there and we need to make sure that we continue to provide humanitarian assistance to them. They're not alone. Tens of millions around the world have been forced from their homes and must live with the daily threat of war. And just when they're at their weakest and most vulnerable, now a new enemy looks ready to attack. COVID-19. Ian Panel. ABC News. Our thanks to Ian for that report. And we turn now to a sexual assault allegation against Joe Biden by a former Senate staffer who worked with him in the early 90s. His campaign has denied it. Tonight, the growing pressure for the presumptive Democratic nominee to address the allegation himself. ABC's Mary Bruce has the latest on this. Tara Reid was a 29-year-old staff assistant in Joe Biden's Senate office in 1993 when she says aides told her to bring him his gym bag. She says she found him in a corridor of a Senate office building and has described what she says happened next in interviews with ABC News and other outlets, including Democracy Now! I was up against the wall and I remember his hands underneath my blouse and underneath my skirt and his fingers penetrating me as he was kissed, trying to kiss me and I was pulling away. Reed tells us that at the time she complained to the Senate personnel office that Biden had, quote, made her feel uncomfortable. But she says she did not mention an assault and she has no record of the complaint. She says she shared similar concerns with three other staffers in Biden's office. All three of those staffers tell ABC News that's not true. Reed claims she was forced out of her job. And in fact, I was put in a windowless office and I was had my duties taken away from me. In a statement, Biden's campaign says the former vice president firmly believes that women have a right to be heard and heard respectfully. What is clear about this claim? It is untrue. This absolutely did not happen. This is not the first time Reed has gone public with accusations against Biden and her claims have evolved. Last year, the candidate came under fire from women who accused him of physical contact they felt was inappropriate, like unwanted hugs. 
At that time, Reid came forward to say Biden touched her on the shoulder and neck in a way that was, quote, uncomfortable. But she did not mention any kind of an assault, nothing like the incident she describes today. Reid says after the alleged assault in 1993, she told a few people. She referred us to a friend who says Reid told her Biden put his hand up her skirt during an unwanted encounter. The friend didn't want to be named. Reed also put us in touch with a former neighbor, Linda Lacasse, who says Reed told her about the alleged assault several years later. ABC News also spoke with Reed's brother, Colin Moulton. He told us his sister mentioned in 1993 that she was experiencing, quote, harassment at work. He said he did not know the details until recently, but later he texted us to, quote, clarify, saying he does remember his sister telling him that Biden, quote, more or less cornered her against the wall and put his hands up her clothes. Biden has yet to comment on the allegations himself. Today, pressure growing on top Democrats to answer for him. I respect your question, and I don't need a, a lecture or a speech. Here's the thing. I have a complete respect for the whole Me Too movement. I have four daughters and one son. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's satisfied with the Biden campaign's response. So I want to remove all doubt in anyone's mind. I have a great comfort level uh, with uh, the situation as I see it, uh, with all the respect in the world for any woman who comes forward, uh, with all the highest regard for Joe Biden. Reid describes herself as a, quote, hardcore Democrat, but her story has now been taken up and heavily promoted by President Trump's campaign, his son Donald Trump Jr., and his political allies. Over a dozen women have accused the president of sexual misconduct and assault, including rape. The president says they're all lying. And let's bring in Mary Bruce now. Biden is under some pressure for not personally addressing Tara Reid's accusations. What are his allies saying about this silence? Well, we have heard from many of those close to Joe Biden defending the former vice president and also defending how he's handled this so far. You heard that from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi today. But, Lindsay, there's also a sense in talking with sources that there is a, a bit of a struggle in, in reconciling the Biden's strong support and advocacy for women and women's rights and his silence so far in addressing this himself. But, Lindsay, that all will change tomorrow morning when we have learned that the former vice president will be giving an interview and addressing these accusations. And President Trump was asked today about this allegation against Biden. What did he have to say? Yeah, well, his campaign has certainly been pushing this story pretty hard, but the president told our Kira Phillips that he doesn't know anything about these allegations, and he suggested that Biden might have been falsely accused. Uh, he did say, however, that he thinks Biden should also respond. Oh, but taking, taking the high road a bit there. Okay, Mary Bruce, thanks so much. When we come back, stuck at sea, passengers evacuated, ships nearly empty, but thousands of crew members left behind. Plus, with colleges closed due to the pandemic, outraged students say remote learning isn't what they paid for. Now they want something back. And a very special thank you for the World War II veteran who helped raise money for Britain's National Health Service. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine.
make sense of it all. Now, Afternoons on ABC, one place with the good information you need. We are all in this together, and we're going to get through this together. Pandemic, what you need to know. Afternoons at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. American Airlines is reporting a staggering loss, more than $2 billion in the first quarter. The airline is now trying to find a way to survive the pandemic, including federal help. Air travel in the U.S. remains down 95% from a year ago. And as images like these surface, word tonight that five major carriers will require passengers to wear face masks. American Airlines, Delta, JetBlue, United, and Frontier, they are the only U.S. airlines so far, but some Democratic senators are urging federal action on the issue. Cruise ships, they were some of the first places where we saw that people quarantined as coronavirus started to spread. Passengers were evacuated, but thousands of crew members were left behind. And weeks into the pandemic in America, they are still trapped at sea. ABC's Gio Benitez has more. 25-year-old Melinda Mann of Georgia has been stuck on a Holland America cruise ship with no passengers for 47 days and counting. I spend 21 hours a day in my cabin, 21 hours a day. When she leaves... Here's some video from inside the ship. It's a ghost town. The U.S. denying her and dozens of other American crew members the permission to disembark in L.A. this week. The CDC telling ABC News the refusal of Holland America and Carnival executives to attest to safe disembarkation conditions is the reason why CDC did not approve it. There are close to 50,000 workers on 69 ships anchored in U.S. waters, all stranded like man. Most are foreigners. It's not just me that deserves to go home. Our thanks to Gio for that. Coming up with many putting doctor's visits on hold, new concerns over children and their vaccines, what doctors are doing to make sure patients feel more secure at their next checkup. Plus, a silver lining to a world on lockdown. Carbon emissions are falling to levels we haven't seen in more than a decade. We'll break it down for you by the numbers. And our tweet of the day, LeBron James responding forcefully to reports the rest of the basketball season could be canceled. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. He's like, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. Who else was underage? All of them. All of them. He told me the younger the better. How did he get so rich? How did he get away with it for so long? And what do the women who survived his crimes now have to say? <laughs> Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. 
Welcome back. With much of the world on lockdown in recent weeks, global energy use is at record lows, and that means less carbon dioxide in the air. Let's take a look by the numbers. Global carbon dioxide emissions are at their lowest level in 10 years, according to the International Energy Agency, with coal plants seeing a big drop in use. That means the skies over many cities are a little bit clearer, with CO2 emissions projected to drop 8% this year, drop six times as large as the previous record in 2009 during the last economic downturn. The report says global energy demand overall will likely be down 6% over the full year as stay-at-home restrictions have kept businesses shuttered and the roads clear. And with fewer drivers on the road, gasoline use dropped by 5% in the first quarter. Demand for oil this month is also 29 million barrels a day lower than last year, a 30% decline and a level not seen since 1995. When we come back, worries continue to grow over our nation's food supply. Supply, the workers on the front lines and one senator's push to keep them safe and our stores stocked. Plus, schools under strain and students demanding refunds for months of remote learning. We dig into the college crisis unfolding across our country. But first, here are some of the trending headlines on ABCnews.com. of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. 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 Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. a critical point in the country's fight against the coronavirus, the end of the White House's social distancing guidelines. President Trump announcing Wednesday he won't renew them. The onus now on the states. Well, they'll be fading out because now the governors are doing it. Some states still under stay-at-home orders are under pressure to step up plans. That includes Michigan, where another protest is taking place at the Capitol. The group protesting Governor Gretchen Whitmer's request to state legislators for an extension of the statewide emergency. In the past month, the Navy's floating hospital ships served to ease the burden on New York City hospitals overwhelmed by coronavirus patients. Now the ship is leaving New York's harbor, heading back to Virginia. A hospital ship treated just under 200 patients during its month docked on the west side of Manhattan. The temporary hospital at the Javits Convention Center discharges its final patients by Friday, though the medical equipment there will stay in New York in case of a resurgence. The nation's unemployment is spiking. Another 3.8 million people filed for jobless claims last week. Many shopping centers set to reopen across
across the country. Macy's CEO says that they will open 68 of their stores beginning Monday and they will have all of their stores open within the next six weeks. Vice President Pence touring a General Motors plant in Kokomo, Indiana, where workers now making ventilators in the COVID battle, partnering with Ventec Life Systems. Pence, the head of the Coronavirus Task Force, wore a mask and goggles during today's GM visit. He was criticized for not wearing one during his visit to the Mayo Clinic earlier this week. NASCAR announcing its season will resume May 17th with seven races in 10 days, including four in the Elite Cup Series. Trouble! Major League Baseball is reportedly weighing a number of options for restarting, one of those playing in empty stadiums. Get the players all tested so they're negative and they're not going to infect each other. The NBA, meantime, informed owners this week it's targeting no earlier than May 8th to allow limited individual workouts in cities not subject to government restrictions. The goal is to allow a safe and controlled environment for players to train. Could dogs be used to detect the coronavirus? A pilot the program at the UPenn Veterinary School will use eight Labrador retrievers in a scent detection study. Dogs are already used to detect certain diseases. The hope that they'll be able to identify COVID-19 positive patients and help with the broader screening process. Welcome back, everyone. Now to our nation's food supply. Many meat processing plant workers are now protesting orders to remain on the job. At least 22 facilities are currently closed because of COVID-19 outbreaks, and some workers are now saying they will not go back without better testing and safety measures. ABC's Matt Gutman has the latest. Tonight, a first glimpse inside a meatpacking plant. Workers crowded shoulder to shoulder at a Georgia's poultry plant in Arkansas. You can see them pushing through that plastic sheeting, masks down. No social distancing. Worker advocates say this was shot just this week. And here at a Tyson plant in early April, workers sitting around open tables. But this is what Tyson, which says it's committed to protecting its workers, says break rooms look like now adding those dividers. What do we have going on? In Arkansas today, police called in to escort protesters off the property at this poultry plant. Labor organizers saying these essential workers are in jeopardy. They are just waiting to see when are they going to get sick, and if they're going to get sick, if they're going to die. And if we don't protect them right, we are going to see a food crisis, we are going to see a health crisis, we are going to see an economic crisis. Across the country, more than 6,500 meatpacking workers infected with COVID-19 the virus killing at least 20 of them, including at least six from this beef plant in Colorado. At least 22 meat processing plants shut down nationwide just over the past two months. Concerned the shutdowns would trigger food shortages in America, the Trump administration on Tuesday giving meatpacking plants wide latitude to reopen as long as they follow federal guidelines. I think we're having uh, these plants prepared to open in days, not weeks, some maybe by the end of this week. Our thanks to Matt Gutman for that. And for more on this, let's bring in Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. Thanks so much for joining us, Senator. My pleasure. So your home state of Wisconsin has certainly been hit by this issue as a beef plant in Green Bay has temporarily closed after COVID-19 outbreak there with at least 290 confirmed cases. So let's first ask you, what more can and needs to be done to ensure that workers are safe? Yes, yeah, so first of all, we have multiple meatpacking plants that are currently closed because of outbreaks in those plants. And it's clear that um, while uh, uh, workers at uh, meatpacking plants are considered essential workers, and this is part of our food supply chain, we cannot and should not uh, demand that workers go into a setting where uh, they're putting their very lives their health and their family's health at risk. And uh, once a plant does have to close because of an outbreak, there has to be thorough uh, sanitizing, but also we have to be assured that as they reopen, that they're putting in the very basic elements of what you need to uh, maintain social distancing, uh, whether it's masking, gloves, and um, appropriate uh, break rooms, et cetera. None of this um, was in place, and there's no mandate on the part of the very agency that looks out for worker safety and worker health, OSHA. There's no mandate right now uh, uh, about 
uh, emergency temporary standards for work during this pandemic. So let's go one step further with that, because I want to get your reaction to President Trump's executive order invoking the Defense Production Act to keep meat packing plants open. Therefore, you've already expressed that you are concerned that essentially this order gives a pass to companies to reopen or stay open without mandatory guidelines on safety measures. So what's next? Well, first of all, some of what he has ordered is literally impossible. If you have a third or more of your workforce who's sick and unable to come into work, you can't reopen. Um, but I think that we have to go far beyond that and say uh, that they should not reopen until we can uh, have in place standards for the protection of those workers. Just today, the agriculture secretary said that uh, some plants will be ready to reopen in days. Is that enough time to get proper safety measures put in place? And should these plants still be following guidance from local and state officials if there is another outbreak? So certainly, uh, if, if a plant has been down and is being sanitized top to bottom, and you have a workforce that has tested negative uh, and uh, is healthy enough to be at work, um, that's, you know, in part what we need. But um, I don't think anyone should be asked to take their uh, health and lives, uh, make, those, uh, make themselves and their families at risk. Uh, until we have these adequate safeguards. And then on the flip side, what do you say to farmers and ranchers in your state who say that they are being hurt uh, if these plants can't stay open and there's a backlog in processing animals that they're raising? How, how do you strike the right balance? Well, it's very difficult. I have to tell you that long before we were seeing uh, huge impacts in the meatpacking industry and livestock farmers, uh, we, we've been seeing a devastating set of impacts in our dairy communities where literally uh, milk is being dumped um, because of disruptions in the food supply chain. We've seen such increased consolidation in the meat packing industry with very few companies um, uh, really uh, processing vast majority of the meat supply we have. What it's meant is that uh, the factories have grown bigger. It's harder to uh, socially distance and the capacity for uh, a devastating outbreak uh, has increased. And so, uh, again, uh, we need to focus on essential workers right now, and then moving beyond as we gradually start to reopen our economy, we need to uh, make sure we have standards in place for the next wave of workers who will return to workplaces. Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Tonight, on the eve of College Decision Day, we look at how the pandemic is changing higher education. With remote learning, cash-strapped students are wondering if they're getting the education that they paid for. Meanwhile, many colleges and universities are also on a financial brink. ABC's Terry Moran has this report. It's a college experience Marshall McGuire didn't ask for. He's a drama major at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and he is honing his craft in his parents' living room. I've moved furniture to odd places in my house to make sure I have enough room to do all the dance combos that we need to do. Marshall is one of the countless university students across the country who are figuring out how to adapt to life under COVID-19. A whole collegiate generation has gone from attending classes on sprawling campuses to their parents' homes. I'm more nervous singing in front of my parents than I am for the people that I met two months ago when I started going to school. For a lot of students, the appeal of higher education is the interpersonal experience. You've got world-renowned faculty, you've got an incredible curriculum, and you're in New York City. Like, that's like the top three reasons why you would go to a school like that. So now that everybody is in their own environments and trying to keep up with this curriculum that we would normally do when we're in New York, it's just not the same. Now that most colleges and universities have shut their doors and switched to remote learning, many students are left wondering, why do they still have to pay the full price? We're here for fair tuition now. The University of Chicago is one of many schools across the country that has decided not to refund some or all tuition payments to students for their spring semester. This is an expensive school at the best of times, and the price tag on a quarter at the University of Chicago is a lot to ask of any family during any time, and now isn't, just that 
because of the circumstances, um, it's especially impossible and people need relief. Livia Miller is a sophomore. She and a dozen other students organized a protest in front of the home of Robert Zimmer. He's the president of the University of Chicago. This hits home for me because we see how much money the university has. But when it comes to supporting students who are really struggling, it, it doesn't seem like the university cares at all. While the University of Chicago isn't charging students for unused services like dorms, they say in a statement to ABC News that tuition is an essential source of funding for the university's ongoing operations, including support for financial aid, as well as faculty and staff salaries. The university adds that reducing tuition would hinder its ability to provide all of its current educational offerings and to fulfill its core research and education mission. And though the University of Chicago has set up financial services for students in need during the pandemic, for senior Haley Hill, it's not that simple. She said her family makes too much to be eligible for the financial aid, so she's taken a job as a live-in babysitter. I don't know when I'm going to get a job, if I'm going to get a job, you know, like I obviously like I love living with this. Um, but it's like once once that time ends, once I'm no longer needed, then I'm, it's time to move on. But what do I move on to? The future is also uncertain for many colleges and universities. This pandemic is pushing some over a financial cliff. According to a report by the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, there were already a quarter of a million fewer students enrolled in college last year than the previous year. And now the loss of expected revenue and funding for many of these institutions is staggering. For example, the University of Michigan anticipates losses of $400 million to $1 billion this year. And California's university system lost $558 million in unanticipated costs in March alone. But struggling students like Marissa Riggs, a senior at NYU, say they're not getting what they're paying for right now. We would like monetary reimbursement that reflects an online education. And we would also like transparency as to where our money is going. We haven't really been told where our tuition money goes. We've just been told that there is no money to be given for reimbursement. But we don't know why. NYU says it has refunded students for housing, meal plans, and other fees for the remainder of the semester, and that 99% of its classes are still being held, albeit remotely. Students are still making progress toward their degrees, the school says. That the university still needs to pay faculty salaries, pay for the facilities that the faculty use, pay for research labs, libraries, support staff. So there is a cost that's going to be part of tuition expenses, regardless of whether or not it's in person or it's on campus. While some students feel their school administrations have let them down, others remain optimistic and they see a silver lining. I'm so, like I said, incredibly grateful that you have faculty who are, who literally sat down at a computer and was like, you're right, we're gonna have ballet class through glorified FaceTime. You know what I mean? Like that is the silver lining. It's the fact that none of my faculty have lost any drive. Terry Moran, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks to Terry for that. And turning now to more fallout from the COVID-19 crisis, doctors say they're seeing a sharp drop in vaccination for children. Many parents have been fearful of taking their kids to doctors amid stay-at-home orders. But experts warn we could see a dangerous rise in preventable illnesses if that continues. Our Ariel Reshef reports. 18-month-old Ethan Paget was due for an important checkup. I am, you know, a proponent of vaccinating your children. But like so many parents during the COVID-19 crisis, his mom, Melissa, was hesitant to take him to his New Jersey doctor. I can wear a mask. I can wear gloves. I can wash my hands. I can not touch everything. When you have an 18-month-old, there is no reasoning with that child. And Melissa's not alone. For new mom, Angela King, who gave birth to her son Tucker last month near Venice, California, the idea of going out with her little one, even to the pediatrician, 
is daunting. It makes us a little apprehensive to even go out to see the doctor, even though we know that there's benefits to get back vaccines. Since the COVID pandemic started, there is a lot of fear in parents to come into the office to get regularly scheduled vaccines because they're afraid that their kids are going to catch COVID. Pediatricians sounding the alarm, saying they fear vaccination rates for children are dropping and many children in the U.S. are not seeing their physicians during the pandemic, possibly missing milestone appointments when vaccinations are normally given. One health records company found a 50% drop in childhood vaccines for diseases like measles and mumps. We might start seeing outbreaks of measles, of whooping cough. We don't want to be in a worse place at the end of this pandemic than we were to begin with. Stoking concern of a possible resurgence in serious but preventable illnesses. I think the irony of all of this is that these illnesses for which parents are not vaccinating right now are actually much more serious and potentially deadly for children than COVID is. The director general of the World Health Organization with this stark Warning. When vaccination coverage goes down, more outbreaks will occur, including of life-threatening diseases like measles and polio. The tragic reality is that children will die as a result. And pediatricians are taking steps to keep kids out of harm's way. Our son's doctor's office sending this notice, saying they are cleaning their office regularly, staggering well and sick patients, allowing only one guardian, screening everyone who schedules an appointment for COVID-19 symptoms, and requiring all staff and visitors to wear masks. ABC's Kana Whitworth went to the doctor in Los Angeles with her one-year-old son, Wilder. My doctor's asking that we all arrive here, stay in the parking lot, stay in the car, give them a call, let them know you're here, and then they want you to stay in your car until they have a room available for you to just walk right into. They don't want anybody in the waiting room. They're also asking that all adults wear a mask as soon as they enter the office. Pediatricians across the country working to reassure parents it is safer to come in than skipping those vaccines. We're getting very creative. Just work with us. This is very important. And one of my hopes out of this tragic situation that we're living through is the parents will once again realize the importance of vaccines. And if you missed an appointment, they say it's not too late. Melissa says three candid conversations with her pediatrician's office helped put her at ease. It decided that the risks of not vaccinating our son outweighed um, not taking him right now. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. Our thanks to Ariel for that report and a reminder that the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends vaccinating your children. And if you have any concerns, call your pediatrician. For the first time in its history, the Little League World Series has been canceled. The tournament, which brings boys and girls from around the globe to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, each and every summer, it's been called off, including regional qualifying tournaments, of course. Little League International's president said it would be impossible to hold the events amid ongoing restrictions on large gatherings and travel next year would have marked the 75th anniversary of the tournament, but that celebration has now been pushed back to 2022. Coming up, some feel-good news for you on this Thursday, including a very royal thank you note. Plus, unmistakable, this is genuine surprise on those faces. We'll tell you about the generosity that sparked their smiles after the break. Stay with us. How do you make sense of it all? Now, Afternoons on ABC, one place with the good information you need. We are all in this together, and we're going to get through this together. Pandemic, what you need to know. Afternoons at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 Central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. Now, this is like ABC see. News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, 
live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. We've been waiting for you. Say, say good morning. Good morning, sunshine. Say good morning. I want you to wake me up. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. I'm taking the entire 1.6 million and dividing up amongst all of you. <laughs> Love to see that. Those are some of the essential workers keeping apartment complexes up and running across the country, getting a huge surprise. Their boss, you just heard from him there, Larry Connor, he made $1.6 million during recent volatility in the stock market. And look at this. He decided to hand out those bonuses to his employees. Very generous. Those stories that put a smile like that and these on our faces, we could all use more smiles right now. That's why we've committed to bringing you some good news here at ABC News Live. James Longman has our dose of positivity this evening. Hi guys, we want to dive straight into the ocean this week with some extraordinary pictures out of San Diego, California. Check out these surfers on bioluminescent waves. It is truly extraordinary. And check out these dolphins in Newport Beach, California, glowing in the water. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to get back to nature and I think it's going to happen pretty soon for a lot of us. Next up, we want to highlight an initiative that we've started here at ABC News. People sharing the last picture on their phone before this pandemic started. It's with the hashtag MyOldNormal and people are sharing all kinds of things, even essential workers sharing moments that they uh, enjoyed before the pandemic began. The last photo I have of myself on my phone before coronavirus really hit New York City is a selfie of me and my best friend Kyler. It's from my birthday, which was right before New York City shut down. And he came by my house, brought over a piece of cake, and we snapped a quick selfie to send to my mom. And we both look a lot more happy and carefree than I think we're feeling now. And we definitely didn't realize at the time how long it would be before we got to see each other in person again. Probably the last feeling of normalcy and last pictures reflecting that would be a picture of me and my son and my wife in front of the Eiffel Tower. I've shared my own, actually it was a moment here in my house with me and my boyfriend Alex, we were getting ready to go to a fancy dress party. I think you'll agree, it really does kind of remind us of that innocent time before everything changed and maybe gives us a hint of the lives that we're gonna get back very soon. Now, you can hear more about all these stories on the podcast, The Essentials, Inside the Curve. You can also share them using the ABC News Live uh, handle on Twitter and the hashtag, remember, MyOldNormal. And remember a few weeks back, we told you about a British Army veteran here in the UK, Captain Tom, who pledged to walk 100 laps of his garden, all in aid of the National Health Service here. He wanted to raise a thousand pounds, about $1,200. Oh boy, has he smashed that record. Today was his birthday, his 100th birthday, which is when he wanted to raise the money by. But he didn't raise a thousand pounds, he raised 30 million pounds. Something like more than $40 million. That's an extraordinary amount of money. And so there was a massive celebration for him here in the UK. He even got a flyover from the Royal Air Force. He got a special commendation from the Queen. He's now been made an honorary colonel. The British Prime Minister has uh, thanked him publicly and messages have poured in from all around the country. And most extraordinarily, he got so many birthday cards, they filled up an entire room, something like 140,000 birthday cards. It's pretty extraordinary. He has really felt the love. Happy birthday, Captain Tom. 
People around the country celebrated for him with music. Healthcare workers getting together to celebrate him. He even got a Pride of Britain award. This whole country owes him a huge debt of gratitude. Happy birthday to you. Tom. So we want to wish Captain Tom, now Colonel Tom, of course, a very happy birthday. And everyone else, stay safe and be good to each other. And thank you as always, James. Before we go tonight, our image of the day, nine-year-old Riley from Holliston, Massachusetts. She gave up her tooth fairy money to her local police department with a note that reads, thank you for risking your lives to keep us all safe. So sweet. More than a story about a tooth, that is a story about heart and generosity. That is our show for this hour. We leave you with this. New York City joining together in song. Fittingly, stand by me. Stand